une façon de se sortir. One way of getting rid of shyness is to take on the guise of someone else, making yourself rich, beautiful, etc. And this new character would become more and more arrogant. In one year, he got the upper hand on the group and even became the leader of the 12 Angry Men. In 2005, the young 29-year-old collector fascinated many and became the icon of this generation of high rollers. His technique to retain power, to bring increasingly rare bottles to the dinners. It's interesting, uh, the 12 Angry Men, Rudy was sort of the leader. He was the leader, really, and uh, they all admired him. And it was again, oh, here comes Rudy. Rudy's coming to this dinner. You know, what's Rudy going to bring? What, what incredible old wine that none of us have ever seen before will he bring? Someone who said, you're looking for the best vintages, but I know how we can have them. He's someone you want to trust, because it's not simply confidence that he shows. It's the fact that you want to trust in them because they render a service and because they are the people realizing our dreams. But what does it take to make people dream? Behind the bidding up of ever more prestigious bottles, there was certainly an explanation. It was at this time Rudy developed a rather surprising obsession, which should have set off a warning. After each tasting, he asked for the empty bottles to be returned to him. Rudy would say to the sommelier, the wine director, I want those bottles back, those empty bottles. Please FedEx them to my home in Arcadia. I want you to be sure to wash them clean, but not to cause any damage to them. He was so insistent that he would go as far as getting angry at a restaurant, for example, which had sent out poorly packaged and broken bottles. This was something that would set him off, that the bottles were broken. Kyle Smith would be a witness to this strange behavior. After a dinner, he took a bottle of Romane Conti away with him. Kyle would then discover a side of Rudy which he didn't know. For a simple empty bottle, his friend went into a rage. Very intriguing. He poured this at a tasting. After the tasting, I, that he hosted and he provided this bottle, I um, took the bottle. Um, and he found out that I took the bottle and left me threatening phone calls to get the bottle back. If Rudy reacted like this, it's because these empty bottles were, for him, of key importance. These corpses of bottles actually played a decisive role in the constitution of his famous magic cellar. Not so magical after all, because although Rudy was showing off in New York, he continued to live in Los Angeles. And in his home in Arcadia, he created a craft workshop in his kitchen to constantly bring out these astounding bottles. Michael Egan is the world's best fraud expert. No detail escapes him. He would be the one who managed to prove the guilt of the forger by removing his counterfeiting techniques one by one. He spoke of highly sophisticated methods. Well, the most basic, the easiest way of committing a fraud is just to substitute one wine with another. That means you have a bottle of wine and you just put a new, another label on it and sell it as such. Um, but uh, Mr. Kerr, anyone, really went to the uh, nth degree in creating uh, some very uh, reasonable uh, looking fakes. So how did he create these fine wines from scratch? His modus operandi was seemingly very simple. After retrieving his empty bottles, he filled them with a combination of several wines. Using a funnel, he poured gallons of wine. He dosed, readjusted, and tasted his beverages. It was thanks to his incredible taste and olfactory memory that he could reproduce the taste of the world's biggest wines. He has perhaps one of the best palates that the world had seen in many, many years. He could figure out how to find the bottles with other things, with, with, uh, of other wines, and bring them together to recreate the taste of the wine that doesn't exist anymore. 
Like a three-star chef, he had his own recipes for each of the bottles he wanted to recreate. For a Romanet Conti, for example, his guilty pleasure, he knew that by mixing several Californian wines, he could manage to find the same taste as that of his favorite nectar. Uh, we also saw other wines uh, from um, Na the, Ma Na the Napa Valley, uh, Pinot Noir, which had 40s stroke 50s DRC, leading to the fact that he could actually use this wine in creating uh, a wine from the Domaine de, Domaine de la Romney County from the 1940s or 50s. I tasted his wines. When you taste blindly like that, all alone, it's virtually impossible to think that wasn't it. Because the color matched the age, the taste was correct. It was very difficult, and that's why he was doing this for so long and was never caught. After he loaded the contents into his container, the label came first. Using photocopying and editing software, Rudy the Perfectionist managed to recreate the labels of the oldest wines. He actually treated the labels to make them look older, and we saw a lot of you know, labels that he was experimenting on in, in his house, either by putting them in, in the oven or putting liquids on them, just to get that right degree of um, antiquity. Last crucial step the cork. Thanks to a blade corkscrew, Rudy emptied and refilled bottles without ever piercing the cork. All that remained was to put wax around it for the illusion to be perfect. In this document, seized after Rudy Kernyawan's arrest, the names of the rarest Grand Cru are listed. A kind of to-do list, an inventory of the vintages to be reproduced. But perhaps you should have been more careful over the months, the forger perfected and tested his creations on his acolytes. Then, in late 2005, he was finally ready to launch his global scam.